we'll chop that off when we, when we post it. But we are recording, so we're going to start now. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response. This is session 95 in our series, The Digital Librarian in the Age of AI. It's a kind of a melding of uh, the titles for two of our speakers, The Digital Librarian, a, uh, uh, a website uh, by uh, Nick Tanzi and The Age of AI, uh, a concept or a paper by uh, Pete Leiden, our other speaker today. So session 95, this is it. This is it since March of 2020. Uh, AI is a huge harbinger of social change. The libraries must be part of it. This is a good, well, this is just a declaration, I would say. So we have Nick and Pete with us today. I hope everybody had a chance to uh, click through and, and check them out. Um, they'll introduce themselves a little bit as we get going here. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open collaboration of, of tech innovating libraries around the world doing what we think are interesting things uh, with technology in res as, and uh, primarily in, in uh, communications, uh, but not only. Our uh, host and at the recording helm today is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, based in The Hague, our longstanding partner in a campaign for universal public access. Uh, we think every community should be connected as a baseline for universal access. That doesn't mean every single person is, but it does mean that every person should be proximate to uh, a point of no fee or low fee public access, like a library. Our sponsor, our principal sponsor this year is IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. We thank them so much for their support. Our other sponsors include the Internet Society, the Library of Michigan, the New Jersey State Library, the Texas State Library and Archives, and our media sponsors, the Library Journal and Broadband Breakfast, all so helpful and necessary to the, to the program. Uh, this is our favorite uh, image of the reality today. And these, uh, we started out as a response to the COVID crisis, of course, just when it was declared in, in March of 2020. And then it just was, has been one thing after another. There was a social crisis from the Floyd murder. There was the economic crisis. There's, there's been a political crisis. And, and, and then there's the ever pervasive and the big kahuna is the climate crisis, of course. And now we have you know, a war breaking out all over. All of these things uh, affect society, which, of course, falls to the libraries to respond to. People show up at a library if, if they don't know where else to go. Uh, and, and, and now the, the, the latest addition to this is, is AI. Now it doesn't. It's not necessarily the same type of crisis. Well, they're all different, somewhat, uh, as say COVID, but it's similar to COVID in the way that it just kind of happened everywhere all at once, or it is happening everywhere all at once. And it's been our our most popular topic. These are the sessions that you can all see in, on our YouTube channel, Libraries in Response YouTube channel, that we covered AI and, and got into various aspects of it, and. Um, as, as you see, we're about to do another one here today, right now. Uh, boon or doom, you know, this has been the general conversation on this stuff. We've got, you know, the end of humanity, existential uh, doom, or uh, on the flip side, this will change everything for the better. You know, we'll see. Actually, we have someone who's more on the boon side than the doom side today with us. So... What's new that we're observing anyway is not AI. It's in its various forms. It's been around for a while, but nearly all that's being used internally and back end in systems to optimize you know, supply chain and, and do diagnostics on our behavior as users, but not for us as users. And that's what's new with uh, this generative AI is uh, end user. And that's what's taken the world by storm. We've appointed the first Thursday of every month to be an AI session. 
And that's what we have today is the first Thursday in May, if you can believe that. And we're going to get to it right now with uh, Nick and Pete. So um, we're going to ask uh, Nick Tansy to lead. I'm sorry. Sorry. We're going to ask Pete, Pete Leiden to, to uh, take us out here with um, a, a general story of how positive Pete is. And of all the people I've seen who were positive about Pete, uh, about AI, Pete would be right up there with the with the most positive and <laughs> i sent out a link uh, today to pete's new essay on uh on uh, the reason he's not just optimistic because of fairy dust he has a case for that and that's what you're going to share with us now so pete welcome and uh take it away yeah great to see you folks um great to be here i'm here in uh rainy northern cal right now i'm uh, but looking forward to hanging out with you folks and laying this out. Um, should I, sh I'll sh jump in and let me sh share my screen because I'm going to run through some things. I'll do a little intro when I do that. Let me just do this one okay. second here. I'm going to run this and share. Oops. Did not let me do that. Hang on a second. Can we do that to share screen? Boom. Share. There we go. There we go. You see it there okay? Perfect. Um, well, let me do a little intro to myself. Um, I'm in long-term immersed here in the the barrier with uh, technology. I came out to work with the founders of Wired Magazine in the kind of early 90s when the big tech thing was basically the arrival of the internet, which there's some parallels there, which I'll mention in a minute about it. Um, but since that time, uh, and I ran the magazine, Wired Magazine in the Haiti of the 90s there. And then since that time, I've had several of my own startups, uh, media startups that often were dealing with new technologies of the future uh and i've um run a, a series of of gatherings in the bay area over the years where i bring together innovators from all kinds of different fields particularly technologists uh and we often capture it in various forms of media including my latest which is reinvent futures uh which is my company now that came out of the pandemic uh in which i actually run a series called the ai age begins here in san francisco i'll mention that in a minute here in which I literally bring together up to 250 experts in technology, often AI, to kind of think through the implication of this and really start to wrestle with some of the big questions that are emerging in the beginning of this new age of AI is the way I think about it. So long time in this, and I do quite a bit of public speaking. I've, for the last 25 years since I kind of was back in the day with Wired, I do probably a keynote a month uh, all over the country, uh, occasionally Europe, occasionally outside that bound. So I spent a lot of time trying to communicate what is going on with these new technologies to broader audiences, particularly business audiences. And my company does a lot of advising with C-suites and boards and all kinds of stuff. So in this case, I'm going to give you about 20 minute run here of my latest thinking on uh, what's going on with AI. Um, I basically think we're going to really understand what happened last year with the, with the emergence of generative AI as kind of a world historic moment, not to put be too, too hyperbolic about this. But I think what happened there uh, is really the, the big bang of generative AI is what Don Basie said about it is we've had AI uh corporations on focused projects could use it governments have used it from time to time and but it was very limited in what you could do and you needed incredible amount of resources and you also needed data scientists or coders or all kinds of things to actually make any sense of it or make it work what generative has done is essentially open it up to everybody uh and it really is the kind of big bang where everybody and i mean anybody now can using their voice can interact with this incredible power of, of ai but also all the data behind it uh, and it is the closest parallel is to what happened in the 90s with the AI, uh, with the Internet, which is we had had the Internet before certain academics have been using it, the military have been using it. 
but uh, it was really opening up through the web and really making it accessible to everybody that actually exploded. And that's really made it relevant. And so that's, I think, the really the big moment that actually happened. But I think what the really way to think about this is it's that is really marks the beginning of what I would call a new age of AI. And I, I think I think we really have crossed the threshold here. Like we use the term age um, uh, for those kinds of things that when humans get to a point where they kind of make a step change in their capabilities. Uh, the Iron Age, we learn how to you know, wrestle with, with metals. Uh, once you make that change, once you take that step change, you, 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 these are things that you're going to carry on for centuries. And there's rarely any examples of going backwards off that technology uh, into something else. And I really think we have to think about this as the opening up of a new age of AI. An AI that essentially will be with humans for centuries, and we're in the super early days of it. But I think it actually helps to understand it with that kind of big picture frame of how fundamentally this, this is shifting things uh, with implications for our economy, our society. And ultimately, I, I would go so far as to say civilizational implications. We're not going to be able to get into all that in 20 minutes here, but uh, it's a very big deal. It is happening once again. Uh, Ground Zero is in San Francisco here. I mean, it's been kind of fun. I've been out here for 30 years. And San Francisco is a boom bust town. Uh, and it always happens where you get to the last run of the last big thing and all the financial people and all the people from all the world come in from that last thing. Uh, you know, they realize, oh, that's over. I'm going to leave. And so that same thing happened, in particular with the pandemic, just made it like, oh, everyone's leaving San Francisco. Who wants to be here anymore? Now, the people that actually know the technology and really understood what was really going on, which was laying the ground for AI, stayed here and didn't go anywhere. But also we're waiting for the real story to break, which is when it broke was was the coming out of ChatGPT 3, really. But it was really ChatGPT 4, roughly about a year ago. That really was the the, the, the shockwave that went around. Um, and this, by the way, I will tell you, I've known a lot of uh, uh, this breakthrough of generative AI uh, surprised a lot of AI experts. I mean, people that I've been working in this field for many, many, many years uh, never thought they'd see this in their lifetime. Uh, this is a very common feeling here. And uh, it was also a surprise to me. It surprised a bunch of people how fast it had developed and how uh, the capability that's actually hit. Um, because here in San Francisco, I mentioned that I run this series in the Ferry Building, kind of a central ground zero of the region. And I based, there's a club in there called Shack 15. I basically, uh, a, long, a member there, but uh, I hold an event and a uh, series called the AIH Begins. We just had one about two, two weeks ago. Uh, in which the question of the night we had was, what is the case for techno-optimism around AI? And I brought literally 250 people together. We have about a dozen of the most interesting of them do little five-minute pops. That material is out. My essay that wrote it up is on Substack and also on YouTube uh, through my company. We've got all these little short five-minute videos. Happy to, I'm, I'm sure John could basically spread that later. But uh, so this is something when I'm talking about these things is not just like me kind of stare at the ceiling, think about this stuff. It's really trying to draw off uh, the insights of many, many, many people, in particular, this next generation of Gen AI founders and builders who, by the way, they use the uh, this club is one of the, the kind of central meeting places of, of this whole next generation of uh, builders and founders in the in the Gen AI thing, which is, by the way, buzzing right now in crazy ways. Um this fits into a broader thing, which I'm not going to go into, but I have been over the years. I think what this is really doing is one of several pillars that is going to drive an era of great progress, counter to the gloom and doom that that cartoon you showed. Sure, we have challenges, but I think in many respects, we're underestimating and underappreciating how many positive things are coming together, particularly on foundational new technologies, AI, bioengineering, clean technologies, a bunch of things we, in a broader context and with other kind of talks I do, I can go and go into that. But I would, I'm, I'm trying to reframe what's happening here is many things are coming together, including the idea that we could actually solve some of these challenges like climate change. And I think AI is going to actually play a big part of that. Now, the way I kind of think about this um, is one way to think about this is really we're going through a step. Uh, th there's, there's a technological step change. And um, if you really go back to uh, his technology stories or his stories who cover technology, there's really been, funny enough, there's not that many. There's been about 25 roughly, uh, you know, there's not a super consensus on this, but general purpose technologies that were fundamental game changers uh, for human beings, you know, everything from the wheel uh, to the printing press to electricity. 
it, I think it's undeniable that AI is definitely going to be in that pantheon of just fundamental kind of general purpose technologies that is really going to make a huge difference. But I actually think it's actually a bigger deal than that. And it's because it's what it's opening up is it's giving us a step change into another kind of human augmentation of uh, so, for example, for most of humans' existence, from the running around the savannah to basically enlightenment, uh, the only kind of way we could augment our powers was through, you know, harnessing an animal or two or something that could help that. That what the breakthrough in the enlightenment in the early industrial revolution was essentially to uh, harness the power of physical machines, which augmented our muscle power and gave us the power of two hundred horses plus, and just kept you know, kept going from that point on. And that was really the driver of the Industrial Revolution, the spread of prosperity, a lot of the progress that we've, world building that's happened in the last 300 years here. Um, what, but up until now, anything to do with intelligence had to have a human brain. Any task related to it had to have a human brain to it. If you had to basically sense the world around you in dynamic time, if you had to make a kind of, you know, reasoning with, with things that are moving pieces and actually make a, a judgments and decisions, that took a human. No matter how simple that task was, we couldn't get a machine to do it until now. And that is the real breakthrough here with AI, and particularly with generative, is now essentially we are entering the realm of augmenting our mental powers, think of it as, and this is really an interesting thing because it's opening up a ton of new spaces that we can start to augment and change. And this is why that this is a very big deal in a, in a bigger way, essentially, than some of these other thresholds we've, we've passed. Now, there's been a long history of AI. And if we have, again, I can do an hour keynote or more on these things. But I think what's really important to, to kind of understand, not just is this a very big deal, but it's going to move very fast. And why is that? It's because AI essentially is the culmination of what we've been doing for 40 years here in, in building infrastructure. In other words, um, and so basically what's happened, this is kind of defined my career. It actually, Dodd was saying similar to his career. We, we, we couldn't have done AI 40 years ago, to even 10 years ago or, or, or 20 years ago in kind of the way we're doing it now. And why? Because one, we had to get the power of the computer chips up doubling every in power every two years basically for 40 years which is what now we're finally getting them to the point where we can deal with it at. we had to connect everything to the internet believe me when we started in wired 20 even just 30 years ago like it was square one no one had it was connected we had to get every one and everything and we're well on our way to doing that there's, there's some people on the planet we still got to finish connecting but that is largely done we had to digitize all data honestly at the beginning of this time the data wasn't digital it was all analog we had to digitize it all. We had to collect it, which is a huge thing. Uh, then we had to basically get it all to the cloud. This is if you were in a corporation for the last 15 years, all they talk about is the digital transformation. That was a big thing. And, and in society is doing the same thing, but we had to basically get it all accessible and basically interconnected up in the cloud. And ultimately, this is a little controversial, but I would argue we needed to actually have the kind of very prosperous tech companies that could put billions and billions for the last 15 years into this research that didn't necessarily have any payback and so there's been some key breakthroughs, particularly through Google, uh, happened about 15 years ago um, that the federal government wasn't doing. And they're just, uh, you know, we needed essentially that kind of thing. And only then do we get to AI. And this is the thing to really remember is like AI doesn't need a comparable 40 years of infrastructure. It is the culmination of this infrastructure. And that's a big deal because every one of those other step changes I mentioned, electricity, once you could discover electricity, then you had to build out electrical wires. It took, you know, literally... 40, some, by some estimates, 80 years to do that. Um, this doesn't require that. And so this is going to move fast, much faster than we're no, normally used to. And that's something I'm, I'm trying to really get drive home here. There's also been two main approaches um, to AI. And again, I could go all night on this. Since the beginning of kind of mainframe computers has been thinking about this, there's been two schools of thought. One is we're going to code it, but the humans are going to code in everything from the top down. And the other one was like, well, what if we got powerful enough computers and enough data, we could basically, the, the computers could teach themselves. The teach themselves thing, we didn't have the power or the data at the time, so they were kind of ostracized. So only 20% of the researchers kept on that, and they were kind of pushed to the prize on the outside. And we tried this other route. It only happened, boom, about 15 years ago, where essentially we realized, God, we have the power and the data to do this. And so it shifted, and that were the breakthroughs, and that's why... Essentially, we've watched this crazy run in the last 15 years here. Um, some of the implications of this, well, these are actually last year, I did several of my events were really centered around these key questions here. But this one, um, once you made that breakthrough, and this is right around the time of when, I don't know if you guys remember, but when um, DeepMind, Google's, well, Deep, Google had bought DeepMind, but DeepMind bought uh, 
beat the, the the world's best Go player. It was about 20, 15, 16. Um, that was the, the example of with the breakthrough of this a technique. But basically, since that time, investment has gone up through the roof on what they call neural networks, LLMs, large language models, and this uh, new approach to, 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 to that. Patents have also taken it off in the same way in all kinds of areas. The way, the reason they topped off there was was simply the um, the uh, pandemic, which screwed everything up. But in general, you can see how that has exploded. Now, if you take investment like that and, and patents like that, you can say the next decade is is just looming here with all kinds of breakthroughs. Um, we've also then um, watched. Uh, this is another way to kind of think about it for a layperson. Is essentially the entire history of computing has been how can you open up computing power to more people and back in the day actually john and i were just chatting about this when you're in the mainframe area literally you had to really have arcane coding languages and all kinds of stuff which i i frankly had to learn at the time then the pc kind of made it a little bit more popularize it the web made it easier to kind of link to things and let the computers do stuff for you mobile has kind of opened it up with more apps but this is the breakthrough it's the voice this is basically anybody just using their voice can now interact with a very sophisticated way with this AI and also with all this data behind the AI. This is a huge breakthrough. And it also is going to, and also since it can speak all kinds of languages, it's going to open it up to classes in ways that just not college educated people basically learning the global language of English, um, which is kind of the current state. It's not, no, everybody can now do this, including, you know, the guy who said it, you know, basically, uh, in any class in any language around the world so this is actually really an access to this and you guys are all our barriers like this is a good thing and a lot of people are going to be able to do that positive possibilities as i had a whole nother event on this last year there's many of them but i think the way to think about it in a big picture way is because we all kind of understand how cars work the, the first 40 years of cars you had to you just were figuring out what is a car okay we had to set up you know filling stations all over the world you know every neighborhood in the country anyhow that was where you made money and that's where the en energy was and then but once that got set you could say oh what do you do with the car if every individual has it okay yeah, we build suburbs malls fast food boom any all that now, everyone's been through that and you can see how that works we're in the same situation with ai right now we as i mentioned to you we've spent the last 40 years building the foundation you know you could think of it as what's a you know personal computer at some level but what's happening now is we're going to go, what can we do with this stuff? And it's going to boil into all kinds of things. Executive assistants, individual tutors, autonomous vehicles. We're starting to watch the beginnings of it. Now, one of the big things when I talk to people is the big thing that people talk a lot about is uh, personal assistants, virtual assistants, agents, essentially, are right on the corner here. We're on the cusp of it. In the next couple of years, it'll be kind of routine. Um and one of the things they're thinking is these things could boost the productivity of knowledge workers by at least, you know, some people it's, we're trying to estimate it at half again, maybe twice as much productivity. And, and there's all kinds of new things. Again, if we had time, we can go into some of the more specifics on this. But one of the things that is clear is this is boosting the productivity. Uh, the coders, for example, some coders say it makes them 10 times as, as productive because they could let the AI do all kinds of downstream drudgery work that they used to have to do and they can just stick with the creative work but one thing about that is if you punch up the productivity rate which we did you can see here this is the general uh productivity rate since the the great boom in the 50s and 60s which spread prosperity to everybody it flatlined for a while it's picked up a little bit in the digital revolution there was this thing of in the 90s and the 2000s you can see how that's going up there too again uh, but it's been flatlining recently. Now, the reason productivity is the key to growth, because productivity drives economic growth, which, again, spreads prosperity and wealth and all kinds of stuff. So that's been the driver behind what essentially has also been GDP per capita over the years and raising everybody's uh, standard of living. Um, this, there has been this recent stagnation of productivity. There was a boom coming off the, 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 the digital revolution and the Internet boom which it went up and then it went down again. But now we're watching the last three quarters, it's been going up again. And there's a lot of speculation that this is going to drive through the 20s, uh, if not beyond that. So I threw this out here. It's not out of the question that we're going to actually see uh, really higher growth rates in the next, uh, which has a lot of implications by all kinds of stuff, tax, coffers, all kinds of things that people I think are really underestimating. Um, tutors, this is up in your world here. Basically, if you can do a personal assistant for everybody, which is, again, happening, there's not a debate of what's going to happen. It's just the timing. You can do it for kids. 
And there is huge implications on this, basically, uh, for really fundamentally changing the way we do um, education. And here's a good example of it. Basically, everybody's used to this. When you take one teacher to 30 kids, this is kind of the bell curve of kind of, you know, outcomes that we've been used to over the years. All of us have probably seen this. You, the people that get the A's at the bottom and the people failing the bottom. Here's the thing. They've been many tests with human tutors. When you put a tutor on any kid at any level, including the lowest kids, those kids basically, you can push them to the top of any curve. Uh, it's it's just a thing that happens, that kind of individual attention. And so um, now if we could get a, a, a tutor like that to every kid, not to replace the, the teachers, it's just to aid the teachers where that thing you know, that basic uh, tutor would follow the kid through all the schools but also be able to know that kid push that kid you know kind of know the kids issues go over the hundredth time how to do that math problem anyhow this is a real possible breakthrough in a big way there there are risks and again if we had a lot of time um we could go into this uh i would just say and i did a whole event on this last year with a, again another similar 250 expert types um we don't have the time to do that, uh, but I will say some of these things like hallucinations and, and biases are getting worked out in real time. They're, I mean, they're, they're essentially software issues uh, in some ways. I mean, I don't want to be too flip about it. Some of them are more fundamental, like copyright law. We might have to fundamentally rethink. There are these uh, issues. People worry about job losses. I can get into a little bit of that. Anyhow, these are issues, but I would say they are not issues that are, game, uh, that are going to kill the game changers. There are... The fields that have a cent, these are basically the prices of everything. Anything that's gone up is basically been because of labor costs. And everything that's gone down has been automation here of costs since the 2000s. So think about it. And the reason is because we haven't been able to automate anything to do with human intelligence. But that is going to change. And I think it's going to hit education big. It's going to hit uh, personalized medicine, a bunch of stuff using these things. So we're going to watch whole categories of work that are going to not be replaced, but are going to be augmented. This is another complicated thing. We don't have the time to do it too much. I want to go fast here. But the blue kind of category there are where AI will probably augment the workers in these fields. The red is they won't probably have no augmentation. These are like physical kind of things that still can't get automated. The grays are the ones that we might actually see serious displacement in um, legal legal fields and also these uh, office administration, basically because of all these assistants, uh, virtual assistants. But these are things I just want to say, you know, there's many examples of when um, basically Excel came out. Oh, sorry, uh, we don't have the time for that, but I was just say Excel came out, everyone thought, oh my God, accounting and financial people are killed. And basically that's not the case. And so I will just leave you with this, that there is a narrative struggle that's happening here. And I want to leave you with this um, and uh, we can chat about it later, but all general purpose technologies that come in, they originally come in with risk um, and they basically, but they come in with these benefits and people say, it's like, yeah, and people like it. And what we do is we spend a lot of time, once we realize the benefits, we say, okay, we're going to basically put a lot of human ingenuity to, to lowering the risk. And there's a lot of energy that's already going into that around AI. And ultimately, we get it to the point where it's institutionalized. I mean, you know, we've got built so electricity, which can kill you, basically. If you touch it, we've got building codes, we've got inspections, we've got a million things. Every, you know, we, we deal with it to the point where we don't even think about it anymore. And so everyone from the first general purpose technology of, you know, fire, damn, it can burn you. But yeah, wow, what it does for meat. And it's certainly warm at night. You know, we like, okay, the benefits are going to outweigh the risks of, you know, burning you. And so we figure out how to deal with it. We've done it with electricity, like I kind of mentioned. Yeah, I can kill you, but oh my God, we can light up the room. Let's we're going forward. And I would just say we're in that place now. And so I would just say, don't freak out. That's where people go initially. It's like worrying about it, but essentially the benefits are tremendous on this. And to end here, I'll just say um, we're really at the beginning of an amazing moment here. And I would say embrace the opportunity here. And I think it will change things in pretty fundamental ways, but I think it'll many other will do for the better. And there's many other things we can talk about on that. But for now, let's let's open up it. Uh, you want to keep my remarks to like 20 minutes. So there's my 20 minutes and uh, happy to talk a little bit more later. Thanks. That's great, Pete. <laughs> uh, you make it you make a convincing case for uh, embracing change here and uh, uh, the, the the track of technology that has been our our history uh, of humanity. Your point on risk, excuse me. Uh, you know, you kind of you 
seems like you're advocating, you know, things are moving fast, so don't get left behind. So plunge in and, you know, risk, we'll manage the risk later, you know, we'll solve the problems after they occur, which, you know, there's, that's an approach uh, as compared to, you know, what could possibly happen. Let's prepare for that. And let's build the, you know, and most of those things don't happen, but, you know, some of them do happen. What the metaphor that occurred to me would be like uh, an architect designing a, a skyscraper on a hillside and then bypassing the structural engineer and the soil engineer and just handing the design over to the builder. No, the thing goes up, but you know, then something happens and it falls down. So is, or is that tolerable? Is that acceptable level for people to embrace this technology for themselves to risk something like that? I think, I, I think it's the wrong metaphor, by the way, but I, I would say here's the, the better way to think about it. We are in such an experimental stage that we don't know what this technology can do. We, we don't even know how, to, how good it can do to all kinds of stuff. What's happening now is you're getting this crazy moment where this access to this computing power and this a, a capability is opening up to everyone. So right now in San Francisco, it is booming. There's like, like the, these, everybody's, these kids are quitting college, they're coming here, they're coming from all over the world. There's essentially, a, you know, these houses with a dozen people sleeping on the floors to kind of do it. Um, and the reason is because it's it's exciting moment where we don't know what could you do with this stuff. And so people are just going in a million directions. Now, um, many of those million directions are not going to work or they're going to be, you know, and, you know, that's not to say you do super dangerous ones, but we don't really even know this stuff. So there's a point where you can't really regulate a thing that you're just figuring out. And so I was, and also the other thing about it, because Europe has jumped into the regulation very early, I think you, if you regulate too early and constrain things too early, you actually kill your industry at some level. And that's starting to happen in Europe. Uh, and so this is a global phenomena. It's happening all over the world. And so I think there's this moment where we need to stay very open to what's possible with this, particularly the positive stuff, and be a cognizant. Not deny the negative stuff, but there are many people on that right now, t tons of forums. I think it's overly weighted right now to that, and it's freaking people out in ways that I think is not justified. And I also just think there are the strategic advantages of really letting this, this kind of t technology develop for all kinds of reasons, solving climate change, revamping personalized medicines, you know, rethinking education. Now, will all that happen? Maybe not. We got to think it through. But the point is, there's a possibility of it. We owe it to ourselves to really flush it out and try to do it. Oh, possibility is a good uh, reference point there, and I, I take your exception in my metaphor. Uh, but uh, the we're not it, building skyscrapers it, yet. We're just trying to figure out could well, you even well, what could you build know, with no, this stuff? No, you know, okay. it's like it's like it's more in the, in the lab right now. It's trying to figure out. Oh, okay, we, what can we, we do? We are very different. We are definitely building a new layer to infrastructure, and so yeah. there's a question of. Is there a, is a point we can go past where uh, we won't recover or the cost of recovery will be too high? One of those, just maybe a simple one, is the amount of uh, uh, faulty content that's being generated by AI on which AI is training itself exponentially growing up and, and uh, you know, kind of just creating a large amount of degradation to the Internet itself which is, was already happening before, just because of the, the way, you know, uh, the extraction process of uh, making money off the internet by the, by the major uh, platforms. So do you think there's a possibility we can, we can make a mistake that we can't fix? Well, this is where the one, I mean, this is the kind of the, the debate is like the, the one debate where people push that is, are we building something that could kill us? Or that would, or essentially would, would extinguish humans. Now, the people I talk to, and I talk to a lot of them, uh, most of them think that's almost a ridiculous kind of worry about right now. I mean, if there's ever going to get to that spot, it's going to be decades, if not long term, past that. And we have plenty of time to kind of worry and think about that. But that the stage we're in now is not that level. Now, if you get into kind of, so if you come down that, the next ser most serious thing is what could bad guys do with this stuff before the good guys figure out how to counter it? That is a legitimate risk. And so there is a lot of space right now in terms of security and also military security is around that. And that's a legitimate risk. But many of the other ones, the further down you go, are essentially, I would say, um, risks that are more manageable than people think. 
but when you just think initially of the negative and understand and 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 not understand what we're why are we kind of throwing all this energy to mitigate the risk is to create the space for all these positive things. If there was no positives or very few positives from this technology, we wouldn't want to develop it. And some technologies go that way. They're not worth developing. But this one is, I would say, and because that requires and needs a lot of attention into the risks, but the risks are much more manageable than you think. And some of the ones that people are most freaked out about, like, you know, kind of the, the robots will rule us and we'll all be like animal chattel running around. I mean, that that's just not realistic. In essentially the, the circles I'm talking to. Um, now, there are a few rogue, I would call them rogue technologists that are kind of taking that tack, partially because you get, you know, incredible media exposure on that kind of thing. But uh, that's not the consensus of the mainstream okay. AI right. technologists that I know. I'll, I'll, I'll take your point on that. I would I would say you really touched on a, a point of how uh, technology uh, democratizes power and totally and we've seen that that and that that's a you know uh, that's a cause for pause i would say when you have people with you know ordinary people not ordinary people but people with malicious intent with a you know a bio lab in their living room you know creating new viruses or and i don't mean uh, digital viruses, I mean, biological viruses, these kinds of things. It's like everybody could build a nuke. We don't want to really have that world. We want to have constraints on things that can be extremely dangerous. And so figuring that out is a big challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. And even if the extinction scenario is a small possibility, you know, like 5%, who wants to bet their ass on 1 in 20? I mean, it's... Sorry, I didn't mean to get uh, lewd there. I, I need we need to move here. Uh, that's yeah. great stuff, Pete. We're going to come back. We've got some questions. Uh, I don't think you meant displacing library. You meant augmenting library world. I'll I'll come back to that. So, uh, Nick, thank you for your patience, and it's you're you're up. So, thanks for being here and take it away. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Don and Pete. That was very interesting. Um, I really like that broad view that, uh, you know, kind of the long view of things. So I want to kind of give my library perspective um, on how libraries will navigate AI disruption. And I think disruption is a good word when we talk about AI. Uh, whether you see it as a negative influence or a positive one, it does create disruption. Um, and I appreciate that uh, Pete actually took it back to the 90s which is one of the points of reference I often use is the internet. Um, and while there's some days we rue the internet um, and there was a dot-com boom and a bust and uh, we saw that there was a certain staying power with the internet. Um, and I view AI as kind of a similar disruptive technology. A little bit about myself. Um, I've worked in libraries for about 25 years. Uh, it's a public library perspective. Uh, as you're trying to kind of date me here, um, I started first job out of high school, actually second job out of high school was working as a page in the libraries. So I've worked in youth services, I've worked in adult services, I've worked in digital services as that kind of became a thing. Uh, think of emerging technologies or technology librarian. And now I'm the assistant director at the South Huntington Public Library. And separately, I've done a lot of writing. I've written a few books uh, on technology, on digital collections, emerging technologies, uh, and quite a bit of speaking more recently. My own perspective on artificial intelligence is one where I'm more ambivalent. Um, I tend to talk about it as something that has potential. And potential is a bit of a loaded word. It's the potential for good. It's the potential for harm. But in many ways, our own personal like or dislike of artificial intelligence as librarians is in some ways immaterial to the fact that it's here and we have to decide, we have to better understand the technology, we have to experience it so that we have informed opinions, whether that's ones that I like AI or I hate AI, so we can prepare ourselves, our organizations, and then by extension, our public, our community that we serve to navigate them through the disruption that AI brings. Um, you know, even if you're you're an AI optimist, you have to understand that it disrupts things like the job market, 
um, how we search for things, how we interact with information. And those are new skills that folks need to learn. Um, and libraries as kind of authoritative sources of information need to be prepared to navigate that new landscape. So it's very much uh, AI is here, let's better understand it and let's guide our communities through this consequential technology that is not going anywhere. We often talk about artificial intelligence as though it's something that's coming. I kind of think of like Paul Revere's ride, you know, the British are coming. Um, and we talk about AI like it's a thing that's coming. And we know that artificial intelligence is a subtle technology. It's been interacting with us um, for many years, even if maybe we didn't see it. Uh, Chat GPT was certainly a watershed moment where it was a, a form of AI that people kind of understood and were broadly able to interact with. But as libraries more recently, uh, some of the ways that AI is impacting our organizations, it's part of our digital branches. Um, in the digital age, our web presence has become increasingly important. And while we present our digital branch kind of as a library experience, um, we know that it's a bunch of third party services that are kind of stitched together. Just think about your website, how it's digital collections, eBooks, it's databases, um, it's the actual content management system you're using, um, calendar software, any number of things. And we stitch them together, right? And it becomes a library experience. Well, those third party vendors that we use have been using artificial intelligence for years. Uh, Overdrive that supplies 95% of our libraries with eBooks, about 30% of their customer service was handled by artificial intelligence back in 2019. So it's been a part of that, uh, chatbots, customer support. Uh, it's also part of our user interactions, the rise of digital personal assistants, uh, a voice search, about one in three Americans uses voice search daily. Um, you know, your smart speakers, those are increasingly integrated with things like library digital collections. There's a rise of uh, screenless web browsing with these assistants, and they interact with the various resources that we offer. And then separately, it's the information landscape that we operate in. AI-generated content is out there. Um, AI-authored books are out there. It's influencing reference databases. It's the information landscape that we operate in. Um, it means kind of going back to those classic media and info literacy skills as you try to discern what's real, as you try to verify sources, as the nature of search changes. And libraries are not in a vacuum. So when all of these new AI tools kind of dropped, uh, AI enhanced search from things like BARD and Gemini um, and Copilot, um, while our public interacts with that, so too do libraries and library staff. And it's you know, uh, now you have the rise of conversational search. It changes the way we search for things. You're not going Boolean anymore. You're oftentimes talking like you're talking to a person. The pandemic, I think, was quite instructive for libraries in that we kind of dove into the collaborative work environment. Many of us use Google Workspace more heavily than ever during the pandemic when our physical locations may have been closed um, in things like uh, Office 365. And now, AI is increasingly powering those collaborative work environments. We're seeing Microsoft uh, Copilot. Uh, Windows 11 is kind of adapting to generative AI. We're seeing classic software like Canva that we've all used is influenced by artificial intelligence and in particular generative AI. Um, your Adobe Photoshop now is being influenced by artificial intelligence. So it's an augmentation of existing technologies that we use. And just as the technological landscape changes over time, so too do our patron, our user expectations. You know, they expect us to change with the times. And that's a tricky thing because we do have concerns about AI. We know that oftentimes our user expectations are informed by the private sector. They compare what's going on uh, in the private sector to what they expect from our organizations. Um, imagine that when ebooks really started coming into fashion, people expected the Amazon experience from the library, right? And we had to get better and better and let more seamless with the checkout process. During the pandemic, people modeled contactless service against the library service. Uh, so they wanted the, the target experience, for example. 
on being able to do contactless pickup of library materials. So that's not unusual. Um, and oftentimes they equate convenience with the private sector. Now with the rise of chatbots, um, AI assistants, you know, it's one of those things where we often talk about the library digital branch being open 24 seven, but it's not necessarily full service. So the expectation as these chatbots get better is that type of always available help. Although it's tricky because people expect it to be accurate and good and not an obstacle to getting what they want. They expect personalization. They expect systems that learn from them, that understand them intuitively. And that's tricky from a library perspective. And of course, all of this goes into ease of use. Um, so you know, we know that we've adapted our catalogs over time, from the time of the card catalog to the OPAC, um, but that our ILS, our integrated library systems, our the ability to search library catalogs has always been a little bit counterintuitive. Um, it's always been a staff mediated so, uh, kind of operation. So the idea that these um, that search can become more conversational be can become more easy is also something that I think is a patron expectation. Earlier, I mentioned the rise of virtual assistants, and increasingly we can expect to see um, integration so that my smart speaker can fetch library content. Uh, for example, increasingly bot to bot type of use. Now this is tricky though, because while patron expectations are informed by the private sector, they're also informed by the library experience and libraries have a brand that we've developed that goes beyond books we know. And one of those things that we've kind of curated is tech navigators. With the rise of the personal computers in the 80s, the rise of the internet in the 90s, the rise of mobile in the 2000s, we've helped patrons understand how this stuff works. Many of you do one-on-one -on -one tech appointments, small and large classes. Um, so we've branded ourselves as tech navigators, and now you have this new disruptive technology that's emerged. And so people have that expectation that we know how to use it. Uh, which is tricky because uh, we're all learning at the same time, right? It kind of fell out of the sky for us. We also have a brand um, of being folks that can provide authoritative information. And the value of that has increased in the age of AI when much like the internet, the, the, uh, the amount of information and not necessarily the quality of information is increasing. So that's an important part of our brand and people are coming to us in the age of AI wanting to know what's real and what isn't, what's a good source and what isn't, what's the provenance of information. And that leads into media and info literacy, which is something we've taught in our school libraries and our academic libraries and our public libraries. And that needs to be adapted for the age of AI when the tools for misinformation, disinformation are widely available where seeing is not necessarily believing anymore. So it's, it's tricky. And that's why in many ways, while I'm not entirely positive about AI, I think it's a mixed bag. I am positive about the library because I think it almost elevates our value in the age of AI. Um, you know, Our information landscape has become more complex that elevates the value of the librarianship. Now, if I talk about the private sector and those expectations and then the library, the tricky part for us, and this isn't a new problem, is balancing privacy and convenience. We have, we've had to do that since the age of the internet. We've had to do it prior, it's just grown more complicated. Um, all of our libraries have social media presences, which I would say social media isn't necessarily big on privacy. It's a tricky balance. And when you increase convenience, you tend to decrease privacy. And if you doubt that, turn off location-based services on your smartphone, and see how effective many of your apps become. Um, the tricky part for libraries is balancing. How do you balance privacy and convenience in a way that you know, um, respects our professional ethics, maintains patron confidentiality, and kind of has that informed consent for our users? And what I would say too is that a lot of the issues that we have with AI, the fact that there are so many ethical concerns, uh, and Pete mentioned a few of them, you know, everything from algorithmic bias, um, the environmental impact, I think that is oftentimes um, we don't talk enough about the, um, you know, obviously privacy issues, the provenance of information, the intellectual property concerns that we have with some of this. 
those same issues are an opportunity to articulate an ethical view of AI. If AI is here and the library has to navigate that landscape, we need to present an ethical vision of how AI should be. Um, and that is its own opportunity. It's tricky, it's gonna require debate. And I think these are the times to be having that debate while we watch and wait for that regulatory environment to take shape. Now, as we get our organizations AI ready, I think there are things we should be doing right now, right? As I say, because there's no regulatory environment, really, there's there's the hints of it. European Union's doing some work. There's an executive order. Um, that's a kind of a plan to have plans from our federal agencies. Um, more certainty will come eventually, but while we wait for that certainty to arrive, this is a great time to be talking policy and procedure. We can affect change within our organizations immediately. Part of that is always seeing, maybe I need new policy in the age of AI, but I think a big part of it is revision of existing policy. Look at your existing policy and see it through the lens of a new technology. Um, some examples, we have collection development policies. What does that mean in an age when books can be authored by an artificial intelligence? Um, we have reconsideration of materials where typically we expect a person to exercise, uh, to engage in an intellectual exercise, right? Where they, if they don't like some of the materials you have, they read it and they have to write you a book report. Well, in an age when ChatGPT can author very persuasive arguments, what does that mean? Is that a policy we need to look at all over again? So it's important to look at existing policy, not necessarily try to devise new policy. Policy is also an opportunity for us to create some clarity where there isn't a lot. Um, where staff has questions, how should I be using AI? What is ethical? What is appropriate in a library setting? How do I maintain patron confidentiality? And for a public to understand how we're interacting with this technology, um, because folks have very mixed feelings about it. We should also be experimenting safely. Uh, we have maker spaces in our organizations, right? Because we value experiential learning. Because this technology is happening in the here and now, and many of us are not in school learning it, the only way to learn it in the same way that when the iPhone came out is to get hands-on with it. It's that experiential learning, it's safe experimentation. It's understanding the broad functionality of generative AI, um, so that we can talk about it in ways that are informed, that our like or dislike of the technology is based on experience rather than maybe expectation, what we imagine it to be. And as I mentioned, we need to engage in an ethical debate. These debates take time and legal and ethical are not the same. A lot of folks have very strong feelings about generative AI and uh, intellectual property, for example. If you're waiting for the US Copyright Office to give you a ruling, you may not like that ruling. You may still feel that the use of AI is unethical to generate images. Don't count on the law to answer your problems, right? You still have professional ethics that exist outside of a legal structure. And we need to kind of experience this technology so we can understand it. And then we can turn those skills outwards towards our community. And some of that's gonna be in the form of library programming. And I know we tend to get intimidated because it's new and we think about how can we or, you know, teach others when I'm just learning myself. But in truth, it's not as heavy a lift as we think. A lot of it is just demystifying, which means access. It means just getting it in front of people and giving them a safe space to experiment with the technology. It's also a traditional library thing for us, right? Is upskilling, digital literacy. Uh, you did it in the age of the internet. Prior to that, it was computers. Um, after the internet, it was mobile devices, cloud, social media, digital privacy. We, we've taught this time and time again, information seeking skills. And so just teaching folks the basics of media literacy in the age of AI on some of the ethical issues they may not even be aware of. Getting popular tools in front of them and giving them a little bit of context so they understand how they work, what they can do, what they're not great at doing. And adapting our search strategies for the age of AI. 
I think what we owe folks isn't necessarily to tell them how to think, right? But it's to create informed citizens that can assess their risk in the age of AI, that can understand how these things work um, and understand that that balance of privacy and convenience that oftentimes takes place. So what's next? Well, I think we need to prepare for AI as a service. Um, AI is a little bit strange, I think, compared to past technologies. Typically, from a library perspective, a new technology comes out, and it's prohibitively expensive for the individual, uh, but organizationally affordable more quickly. 3D printer comes out 20 years ago, it was $150,000, right? And it's 100000 and it's 50000 and eventually it gets to a price point where, as an organization, we can get it and we can provide critical access uh, before an individual hobbyist maybe can afford it. AI started out as widely available and relatively inexpensive or in many cases free. Um, but what wasn't there was understanding. So widely available, poorly understood is a dangerous combination. Eventually, my expectation is, is it's going to turn into haves and have nots, that there's going to be access to high quality systems that carries a cost as the marketplace resolves itself, as it figures it out. And then it becomes a matter of equity. Who has access to the ethical or uh, high quality system and who doesn't? And where can the library step in and provide AI as a service? So we need to see it through the lens of digital equity. Um, we also, experimentation is great for staff, but it also needs to eventually take the form of formal staff training. Policy in place, understanding of some of the use cases, the do's and don'ts, and then you can invest in particular tools that match your organizational um, you know, goals, your professional ethics. We also need to be aware of our traditional vendors are coming and some new ones are coming with AI tools. And being able to understand and having experimented with them puts us in a better position to evaluate or are they good, are they bad, are they problematic? Um, do they do things I can do for free? <laughs> you need to have that understanding. Uh, because vendors are absolutely coming. I'm sure they've been knocking at your doors already. And when we talk about that aspirational goal of AI, you know, one of the things we don't like, it feels like information malpractice is black box AI. And that is, you know, you have your query, it goes into a system, the black box, where you don't know the provenance of the information, you don't know what makes up the training model, the algorithm is unclear, and on the other side is your answer, right? And it feels like informational malpractice from a library standpoint. As much as we can have glass box AI, where we can have models that are more transparent, that people understand what's in it, what's the provenance of the information, what is the algorithm, I think are positive developments. And that's one of the distinctions we can draw as we talk about AI as a service. So as uh, me and Peter are in agreement in that, it's a lot to say and not a lot of time. Um, but that's kind of the library perspective here as we prepare to navigate what I think we all can agree on is a highly consequential technology. Wow, Nick, fantastic. Uh, indeed, we, we need, we could do with an hour for each of you at least, uh, but really fascinating to, to get both these perspectives most general and, and to the very specific library world. Uh, you kept referring to uh, uh, literacies and the history of libraries and providing literacy and training. And I, I think this is an excellent point. Uh, this kind of thing is done uh, in enterprises that are embracing this technology. Maybe you could stop sharing now. Uh, sure. Nick, thank you. And um, uh, uh, let me just get Pete and you back on that um, that uh, trust is a is a primary asset that libraries possess is you know the, the, the there's a general decline in trust across all our institutions and in contrast libraries are rising up as a place to seek reliable you know, uh, information from someone that does not have an agenda other than helping you without expectation of gain uh, of any type. And that just grows more valuable. And your point about uh, waiting for 
uh, laws and regulations is also really on point because one of the things about technology advancing so quickly, it's so hard to regulate because it's hard to define. What is that? It's a phenomenon. We can't even put a name on it. And if you can't name it, you can't write a regulation around it, much less enforce it. So this has been this has been a dilemma of uh, technology outpacing uh, regulation, which to Pete's point, Europe has been at the forefront of. Uh, uh, the, uh, there was a, a conference recently and someone pointed out that the top 10 technology companies in the world, uh, none of them are European. They're all American or Chinese. What Europe is good at exporting and regulations. And I, I think that's probably a valuable contribution to this conversation. Somebody needs to be looking at uh, uh, guardrails or trying to come up with reasonable constraints uh, we're seeing executive orders come out now. The the federal government in the U.S. has issued theirs, and and uh, it's happening at the state level and at local level. Uh, CIOs everywhere trying to figure out how to manage all this, and all these efforts at protection and guardrails and system constraints. I don't hear much about the behavior of the end user. Because if you have a clueless or, a, uh, you know, just a careless end user, the security of, you know, your, of your system is undermined. It's just invariable. And this is where libraries, I think, can play a major role in, in uh, AI literacy for a, for a term, which also kind of brings up a question uh, uh, before I ask Pete to respond to your presentation, uh, as you've already responded partly to, to Pete's, and that's this uh, the, this term uh, you use, digital uh, librarian, you know, and everybody kind of knows what that is. Somebody, you know, digitally aware, hip librarian who's there as a resource for uh, all all kinds of level end user, in house, and those kinds of things. How would you define AI librarian? It seems to be more ambiguous than digital librarian. Is an AI librarian a, an AI that does library, you know, functions? Or is it a librarian who is knowledgeable about AI? How would you how would you sort that one, Nick? Oh, sure. So to me, I mean, I think the person is important in this equation. So a librarian who uses AI versus, you know, a AI that's trained by a librarian. One of the things that concerns me about AI is just a matter of responsibility. When it's a person, a person can take responsibility. Um, an AI system is easier to kind of pass the buck and just not have responsibility. Uh, inherently, these systems are human powered on the back end anyways, that they, they take in, you know, um, they learn from us. That's part of our concern with the, the training model oftentimes is, is they suck in environmental and human data. Um, so from a reference transaction standpoint, that's always tricky. What's interesting too, though, for the librarian now is it's almost like two reference interviews you have to conduct. Typically, you know, if uh, you came to me with a question, I conduct a reference interview. And I might ask open-ended questions, which is quite effective for dealing with the person. But then if I'm engaging with an artificial intelligence training, you know, a, a model, a large a LLM, for example, to then get some information to you, I have to engage in a new reference interview with that system and one where open-ended questions are pro quite problematic. So it's almost like you've added another another user to the mix, one that's an artificial construct um, to my mind. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Pete, uh, you have any uh, response or uh, I, I, we had a, a, a request from uh, Dave uh, Hallenbeck for you to uh, uh, respond to uh, Nick's uh, presentation. Do you have any comments now, Pete? Well, one of the nice things about speaking to different groups, uh, which I do, um, is you learn about that group and you learn about that category of things. And, you know, I mean, I've, I'm a library user, but I haven't really seen it through the lens of, you know, your field or your your profession at some level. So uh, it was actually really good to, to watch it. I mean, um, and I, I think a lot of what you're saying is absolutely true, no matter what your own personal um, feelings about this worries or concerns or you know enthusiasm for that matter this is the thing it's happening i mean it's kind of it, it's kind of like uh I, I think the genie's out of the bottle i mean it's not like eh, let's don't do this 
Uh, this one is going to happen. There's so many economic incentives. There's so many other kind of incentives that are going on here that I think it, it's here to stay. Um, and it really is a communication tool. I mean, one thing to actually think about, and I've thought a lot about this and talked to other groups about this, is the, the, the simultaneous language translation ability of this. I mean, a lot of essentially uh, libraries, you know, uh, again, you know better than me, but it seems to me are tapping into, you know, those left behind or don't know how to do it or, you know, language issues or cultural issues or all kinds of stuff. And that is a huge tool. I mean, just think about it. You now have a tool that is basically kind of simple and free that you can basically gives access to pretty much any language now. And increasingly, it'll be all languages. Uh, and I think that's a really underappreciated piece of the puzzle here. And that I think would be a really interesting tool for you folks. I also love this idea of, of you folks as helping people through this transition. I mean, I'm basically full time now trying to absorb information around this stuff. You know, which, which of these LLM models are better for which kind of things, you know, I'm tracking all kinds of commentators on it. I'm reading books on it and stuff like that. I mean, I can barely keep up in just, you know, a full-time endeavor, but I, um, so I think there's this interpretation of what's happening, this pointing out of what's happening. That's really important uh, that you could really guide the average person who's just kind of probably overwhelmed with this thing. Third thing is, I think there is a, again, as always in technology, there's an open source kind of secondary uh, move that happens a little bit at a, in a stutter step with the kind of private companies and particularly the big tech companies. Um, and that's interesting. The, the cost, uh, the, there's open source models in, in which um, it's much more transparent. There is much more understanding of what's going on. It's kind of communally kind of uh, built. And those prices, um, the, the open source LMMs are coming down dramatically. And there's a lot of new energy going into that. And these systems could be more public domain, civic minded, you know, a bunch of different things that I think fit more into the ethos of libraries. So there's a lot of, a lot of positive and interesting things that I think forward motion trends that are coming out of this that would really serve you guys well. And um, it's it's great to see all the energy you're putting into it. So uh, good luck with it because uh, it, it is a, it's an essential thing right now that, but I would just, my own little thing would be Humans always go, and it's like we're wired for, you know, basically they hear the rustle of the bushes, you know, run from the lion kind of thing. That's the genetic line that has made it to us. And the kind of genetic line that was like, ah, oh, that rustle is no big deal. We don't worry about it. They got eaten. And that, that positive kind of, kind of genetic code never got up into our space. So we are kind of wired to originally worry about everything. And I would just try to really try to counterbalance that with a little bit of a sense of like, oh, my God, what are the positive possibilities of this stuff? And uh, try to try to hold on to that in this initial encounter with it, because th there are fears that are easy to stoke. And I think to my mind, they're overblown. It would be my feeling on this and that we've always encountered these kind of situations with new technologies. The Internet was the same thing. I mean, when the Internet first came out with, you know, I was there at Wired Magazine, you know, everyone said, oh, it's only going to be used for porn. And, oh, my God, it's going to be the criminals will use it. And crypto will just, you know, it's like, why would we want to do this? And it's like, well, because, you know, you can now talk to your mother over video, you know, in kind of like ways that for free for, you know, who would have ever thought that. Think of the positive thing of the Internet, too. I mean, there's just a lot of amazing things that come with this, too. So there's a kind of a it's it's just what happens. We'll figure it out. We'll mitigate the risks, I think. And uh, we'll make the most of, of this technology and we'll make it through this juncture like we've made it through all 25 of those other major junctures of general purpose technologies. Well, Pete, good luck with uh, reprogramming uh, <laughs> instinct with reason. That's a tall order there, but, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're running over a little bit and I apologize for that. You know, it's just, we've got so much here today and, and uh, it's predictable that this would be a little bit long. So stay with us if you, if you can. Uh, we'll go on for a little while. Uh, if you have to bail out, there'll be a recording for later. Thank you, everybody. But one of the things that uh, uh, that uh, you, well, one, first, uh, you've just mentioned a, a positive byproduct of, of, the, of the series, uh, Pete, is that we have extraordinary people come on who are not from the library world, who, by virtue of the fact of speaking to librarians, generally think about what it is that, that libraries are you know about and therefore are exposed to what we think are tremendous values that libraries represent 
uh, trust and uh, the the there's no more benevolent institution than the library. And it's amazing how popular they are. Half of the people in the U S are library card holders. Half. We have at the peak, it was something approaching 80 million people access the internet at a public library, you know, like a third of all the adults. It's just phenomenal stuff that, that it's just not a story that is told generally because there's, there's no profit in it. And there's, you know, the motivation and, and librarians are typically civil servants and kind of restricted in how how engaging they can be on the on the civic front. But uh, that notwithstanding, the uh, the um, the case is 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 really powerful. Then this boom and bust cycle. So I, th I think that's a, a point you made. I think is a good one, Pete. In San Francisco, absolutely boom and bust town. Uh, to my mind, the, uh, the the internet or the dot com bubble, so called, was a case of uh, pouring the beer in the glass too fast, and it just foamed over. So it really went to bubble. It was a lot of foam, but there's still a lot of beer in that glass, and and we saw what that was it was it as it as it unfolded. Um, are we now in another bubble? That's the other aspect of of uh, Silicon Valley and, and and the Bay Area is it feeds on bubbles. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made in bubbles for the people that are in first. A lot of people, money to be lost by the people that are, you know, late uh, that buy at the top uh, when something goes down. So it's a, it's a flux that there's a, a lot of risk in that. And so, you know, watch yourself on that. Um, the, um, the literacy question is really a good one because of so much emphasis has been placed on protections and system design that very little is on uh, end user behavior, and I think this is a missing part of the of the general discussion. Uh, we're going to be making this case in uh, uh, in Brussels at the big uh, uh, data privacy conference. It's going to happen there on May twenty second, twenty fourth. We're going to happen to be there. Uh, they've given us press credentials, and we're going to cover the conference and present. We're going to have a session here, and the case we're going to be making is very is that, yes, okay, regulation, yes, system controls, but unless you help people in general understand this stuff, it's going to degrade all the security that you can build in on the system side, and that that's not really what people are talking about. They say, well, we just need regulations. We need to have you know companies constrain themselves, but uh, we think that's uh, a real opportunity for libraries, of course, to play that role. Inside of companies, enterprises, public and private, people do training, you know, don't do this, don't do that, you know, don't share this, don't uh, fall for this kind of a scam. But for the general public, you know, where do you go? You go to the internet, ask them, well, you know, what should I not do? You know, try that. Um, so hopefully that will be uh, will be a good one. So we're, we're over, I appreciate it, but I, I do want to have uh, Pete, you almost made a great last comment. I think it was actually. So Nick, I'm going to give you a last comment chance and then we'll close the recording here. Sure. So, you know, I, I think back to my original thesis, I guess, which is, and on this, I think me and Peter are in agreement, which is AI is here. It's a consequential technology. Um, it's not going anywhere. And, you know, even if say I was to adopt a, Pete's enthusiasm for the technology, right? Uh, very much a techno, uh, what do we say, optimist, right? Um, we still have to understand that it is going to disrupt job market. It's going to change things. People are going to need to upskill. And even in positive developments, because sometimes we think of disruption as a negative thing. Um, disruption is where libraries can come in and you know, help with equity, help upskill, help teach, help add context, um, and increasingly access, as I think my suspicion is, access to high quality AI is going to become a matter of digital equity. Um, there is gonna be haves and have nots, and that's an important space for libraries to operate within. And then again, just that our time right now, as the market takes shape, as all this churn happens, is to understand the broad functionality of the technology, understand good and bad use cases in a library context, um, you know, so we can make those smart investments, we can hit the ground running when 
Windows 11 is an AI powered operating system, you know, that's not the time to start talking and trying to figure it out. Uh, that's not the time to be having ethical debates that should be happening right now. Um, so we can, you know, be a little more unified on this front about what's appropriate and not, and present a unified front too when a vendor comes trying to sell us something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great point, Nick. Uh, markets are not known for their uh, priority on on equity. Uh, they're optimizing uh, profits. This is you know this is just the nature of. Well, you of, can't fault a company for trying to make money, and also in an oh. environment where it's like if we made the speed limit a suggestion, you know everybody has a different idea about what's responsible and appropriate, and and you know, I think in the tech world there is a movement towards move move fast and break things, right? Um, in libraries, we have trust that we built over a long period of time, and trust is a long time to gain, and it's very quick to lose. Um, and I think that's why it's important that we temper it uh, with a bit of caution. Um, that's not AI avoidance, and that's the one thing I tell people is AI, AI avoidance is not a survival strategy. <laughs> um, it, it honestly places you at a huge disadvantage in this time. Yeah. Uh, well said. And so this disruption phenomena, which is clearly, I mean, it's happening. There's no question about that. And that's that kind of the similarity to COVID. It's just, you know, there's no avoiding it. You And we're all awash. It's, it's not just Pete's drowning in information. We're all kind of, you know, being swamped by uh, the, the quantity of information and articles and opinions that are coming out about this stuff. Uh, and so navigating that is is a is a challenge, but that's that's kind of what makes it a crisis in our in our view is just the pervasiveness and the potential for disruption. That doesn't mean it's disaster. It could be, but it it means we really have to deal with it. And so I think we've made a a small contribution to to that today. And I I thank everybody, and I thank thank you Nick, and I thank you Pete for for being here and sharing some just beautiful information. Can't wait. We should have this up by tomorrow and we'll send out a note on it. And it's just been great. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I will end the meeting for all.